Every night I go to bed alone I see your empty pillow next to me But in the morning when I wake up I want to kiss you on your cheek But I'm always alone And it seems you're never home you said you loved me, that I was your heart and soul And I suppose that all the rest was just implied But implication's not the real thing On that I shouldn't have relied There's no way I could have known I needed your Rosetta Stone If you won't stay you leave why won't you leave if you won't stay why why won't you leave why won't you leave with you away I've had to find a way to take care of myself through everything I've gotten good at self-sufficiency The all-time denial king Telling myself that I'm okay But I'll no longer play this game If you won't stay, why? Why won't you leave? Won't you leave if you won't stay? Why? Why won't you leave? Why won't you leave? I used to think that I could wait forever, that it would all. But now's the time to face the fact it's over And long ago I probably should have known That I'm the only one who is alone If you Sing it with me. If you won't stay, why, why won't you leave? Why won't you leave? If you won't stay, why, why won't you leave? Why won't you leave? Thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin Quain is a singer, songwriter. He's written for dance and for theater. He's done commissioned works. He's done a musical that was nominated for six Dora Awards and won the Dora Award for Best New Musical. Mr. Kevin Quain.
Some shepherd you are Make me lie down in strange places Oh, you're hanging me up again Make me buy a rope You and me Crashing the party Long after it's done You old devil I'll miss you when you're gone When you're gone I'll miss you when you're gone When that sweet chariot Swing so low to bust my ass again Where you in? You put words in my mouth You make me speak in tongues Oh, you're crazy Well, I'm up on top of the world Waiting for the kingdom to come You old devil, I'll miss you when you're gone, when you're gone. I'll miss you when you're gone. Ain't that me lying on the floor? Well, ain't that you on the shelf? Oh, you son of a bitch, I'll give you a fall. Nobody listens when you're talking to yourself. your attention I got nothing to say one of these days I'm gonna give you up but not today oh not today well I'm in valley of the shadow again singing the same old song Thank you, Kevin. That song has a lot of sort of religious references, isn't it? The, the devil speaking in tongues, the kingdom come, yeah, I swept, sweet chariot. Yeah, I swiped a lot of it from church. <laughs> nice. 
that uh, f- you frequent there a lot? Mm, not anymore. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> it's uh, inconveniently scheduled. <laughs> what's <laughs> what's the typical songwriting process for you? Do you usually come up with a lyric first, or a melody, or a piano, can, or a chord can, thing? It can be either. I don't. Uh, my main. The, the most important part of my process, I don't work too hard at it, you know, because it's mm-hmm. just I don't think I don't think you should work too hard at it. I don't think it pays off really for me anyway. It doesn't, and the minute it stops being fun and easy, I just walk away. Yeah. So sometimes it takes a while, years sometimes to finish something. And sometimes it's good to have a deadline actually to have a have it put on that basis. Someone says, "Can you do this for me?" And yeah. I will say, inside, I will say no. <laughs> can't do that. I don't think I could do that, but outside I'll say, yeah. <laughs> Have it for you by Thursday. Along that line, do you carry a notebook with you? Do you carry a voice recorder to capture ideas when you're out? No, I just try and uh, just try and remember things. And I, I, I have this notion that's maybe maybe ridiculous, but I have this idea that the good stuff will stick. You'll remember the good stuff, and then the, the stuff that you forget. I don't know, sometimes I have this sense that, oh, I had a great idea, but I forgot it. But then I think if it was that great, I would have remembered it probably. <laughs> I don't know. But again, I try not to worry too much about this stuff, try not to work too hard at it. If I made millions of dollars doing it, I would, t- I would take the whole thing a lot more seriously. You know what <laughs> I mean? I'd get up earlier in the morning. I'd work. I'd, you know. But the way it is now, I just, it's... It's fun. It's it's a good thing to do. Or sometimes I just have you know have a little bee in my bonnet. I gotta chase it down. But most of the time, I don't work too hard or think about it too much. <laughs> you know. Your hot dog to keep in the yard. Your hot dog to keep in. The One of these days you're gonna wander too far You're a hard dog to keep in the yard Keep in the yard. You're a hard dog to keep. 
find you have uh, recurring themes in your songs, things that, that come up regularly? Yeah, I think. As, as some, sometimes those are things that aren't immediately apparent, and sometimes it'll be years later, you just look back at things and you see certain things pop out. But, uh, yeah, so I think things, just the, the, the one thing that strikes me if I look, look back at things I've written, is they're all in some way or another about being lost. Uh, which is that's boring, isn't it? No, I don't think like so. so. There's a lot in there. There's a lot of potential in here. I try and get some up-tempo rockers about <laughs> being found. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Look for that this fall. <laughs> this one's called Las Vegas, Dan, since you asked. Thanks. I'm at the end of the world all alone. They keep me in the dark and they throw me down bones And I get more punches than paychecks Which way is Las Vegas? I keep waking up dead on the floor Can't remember our last big score And I believe this gig is killing me Which way is Las Vegas? I hear it's beautiful there Nothing but money and lights They got millionaires and movie stars and everything And it's always opening night I just want one little sliver of a moon one little star on the door of my dressing room One little spotlight on me in Las Vegas and I don't want company, baby You can drop me off at the station Don't tell me about yourself Let me use my imagination I'm just somebody you never love Stuck in a dump you never heard of In a place where nobody comes from Which way is Las Vegas? Las Vegas Thank 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks. Oh, cheers. Thanks, Dan. Uh, is there anyone that you'd love to hear sing one of your songs? Living or Dead? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyone. Anyone. I let them sing the song and kill them afterwards if they didn't do a good job. <laughs> oh. That'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, it'd be, wouldn't it be great to hear uh, Frank Sinatra or Elvis? Um, uh, Tony Bennett. Uh, Dolly Parton's great. I love Tolly, Dolly Parton. I love her, her singing. Uh, I love, she's a great spirit. She's hilarious. Nina Simone. It'd be cool to hear what Nina Simone would do with one of one's songs. She always has such a, a, a unique and powerful uh, stamp uh, that she would put on songs. This is uh, Rain on the Midway. some beautiful images in that. Is there anything about yourself that you've been careful not to reveal in a song, not to reveal to the listener? Oh, yeah, everything, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, illusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you don't want people knowing about yourself. I don't want people knowing about it. it doesn't, it's not. It's just, uh, yeah, that would send the wrong message. 
trying to, just the opposite, really. All of this is just uh, uh, to make up songs, and it, it's uh, one is uh, presenting, uh, one is hiding uh, more than one is revealing. I think that's. I don't want to. I don't want anyone to know stuff about me. Everything. This is gonna shock all my Facebook friends. It's just I make all that stuff up. I don't even have a cat. <laughs> I know cats are popular on the internet. That's why I feign <laughs> feline friendship. But uh, I I don't I don't don't have a cat. Is Bill real? Bill's real. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In your introduction, I. Uh, I talked a little bit about your musical. Uh, was nominated for six Dora Awards, won the award for best new musical, called Tequila Vampire Matinee. Yeah. What can you tell us about that experience? How it came up and uh, well, how, it, uh, how it went? Yeah, it was one of those things where I just I didn't know any better. And sometimes you can, you can get stuff done if you don't know any better. And sometimes if if you know in advance what the the amount of work something is or the the beating that you're gonna take. Uh, trying to get it done, you wouldn't you wouldn't do it. So sometimes this innocence or naivete is uh, is good. So I had uh, I had no idea what was involved in writing a musical, and I just I was I just thought it'll be fun. <laughs> we'll put on a show. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize that the reason that a lot of uh, uh, plays in Canada, the, when when you look at um, you know the front page of the Dramatis Personae, it'll say two guys and a hay bale, right? Because you can tour that thing in a, <laughs> in a little, a small car. But so I just had characters after characters, and just, I had no idea, right? So, but, uh, now that started out as an album, and yeah. then became a musical, didn't it? Yeah, people c kept saying that they felt that there was a show in there, or a movie, or whatever, that there was, that there was a lot of, I don't know, something, something visual, or whatever. And I guess that, that's the idea, sometimes with a song, you're trying to put, Put pictures in people's heads. So sometimes, if yeah. the, if if they get that, then you win. And so, <laughs> but uh, so people said that, and, and um, I didn't really necessarily have anything particular in mind. But I thought it'd be fun to do, just to take that yeah. song cycle and try and create a musical. Um, but not knowing a lot about uh, playwriting, um, I, I thought, well, uh, I wanted to to. To hang it on some some architecture that already existed, and so I looked to Shakespeare initially because my understanding is he's he's pretty good, oh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> that that's good stuff. But n nothing really popped out. But so I'm a, a big opera fan, so I, I looked I looked at operas, and, and Pagliacci seemed to fit. And I liked Pagliacci because um, the the music and the libretto were written by the same person, which is it's quite unusual in in opera and musical theater as well, um, and also that he based it on a true story, uh, which I, I liked too. So it's kind of a reality uh, opera, and it had and it's, it's two acts, which is kind of unusual. It's short-ish, and uh, <laughs> it has clowns in it. And uh, by the way, Fox has ruined the reality opera genre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That do they have? I don't have a television. I haven't had a. Oh, yeah, they have a lot of long. those. Fox has a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get rid of your TV, man. It's not good for you. <laughs> get a piano instead. Our next guest is uh, Jay Pollock. Jay's been uh, a really good friend of mine for a while. And when I'm telling other people about Jay's songs, I always say that uh, what gets me the most is his use of metaphors. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of writers use metaphors to sort of distance themselves from the subject matter. Uh, but Jay uses what by all rights should be the most obscure, inaccessible metaphors. But when you hear him use them, you somehow have a better understanding of what he's talking about. And that, to me, is a brilliant metaphor. Please welcome one of my absolute favorite writers, one of my best friends, Jay Pollock. <laughs>
black line on the Richter scale. It's been a year since the ship did sail, so could you grab a bucket and start to bail me out? No knee-jerk reaction. I'm at full speed with no traction, so let's get all of the facts in before we start. I see no fine print below your dotted line. There'll be no tripping on your wet floor sign as you mop the tears up from my mind. Thanks. Cause I'm the type who manages to escape the damages. But could you help me with my bandages, please? Oh, I'm glad I took it slow. Cause I could have brainwashed myself so long ago Still may be tender just below So could you please peel off these bandages real slow Before we go Archimedes principle Displace and make invisible The emptiness that made us full before Fingers point with diagnosis The pendulum swung And now I show this reluctant doorstep A dozen roses now Glad you took it slow Cause you could have brainwashed Yourself so long ago It still may be tender just below You're gonna peel off These bandages real Yeah. Thanks, guys. There's one lyric in there that just kills me. There'll be no tripping on your wet floor sign as you mop up the tears from my mind. Yeah, that's about you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a. Uh, yeah, there's no real metaphors. These are actually all just meant to take. Uh, Completely literal, so I was just talking about it, <laughs> janitor and stuff. But yeah, it's a, it's it's a tune uh, about uh, just people putting things out there on the table up front and uh, communicating and uh, 
But it would be pretty funny to trip on a wet floor sign. I just think it's the most, <laughs> like, that's the best ironic thing ever. I want to see it happen. I don't want someone to get hurt, but I want to see someone trip on a wet floor sign. That's, that's the only reason why I wrote that tune. So what's, uh, how about for you, what's a typical songwriting process for you, Jay? Do the lyrics come first, or a guitar riff, or a melody? Uh, it, it, it's got to come with, with something musical. It's got to come with some sort of progression of some kind. And, like uh, a chord progression? You yeah, mean. just, yeah. you know, a few things going on. Um, it has to be usually uh, either after 3 a.m. when I can't sleep, or um, after 11 a.m. when I'm way too high on coffee. <laughs> and is there, when you're writing, is there, do you seem to, to reach a, s a common stumbling point? Like some people find trying to write a B verse or trying to write a bridge, they always get stuck. Do you have any points like that that are common when you're writing? There's a lot of those, but um, I think um, if I get to that, I just, I just don't do it. Um, that tune never had a bridge, I don't think. No. Um, if there's a bridge and it's saying like, Hey, I'm a bridge. Can I join the tune? I'll be like, all right, come on over. <laughs> but uh, it's weird talking to a bridge, but I would. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, there's no formula, I, I don't think, in terms of what I have to do. Um, now you, you often don't write bridges. No, yeah. no. They're, um, sometimes people just put them in. Sometimes I don't. I'm cool with it. <laughs> Are you guys all right with it? Yeah. yeah. So why don't you play uh, circuits? This is another one of your. This has a bridge. Yours is a real, a real. I'm, so, I'm like, yes, there's a bridge. Yeah. Cool. Nice. I actually do want bridges in every song. I, I just can't. This one gave me nightmares for the first six months. I wrote it. of this mess the three ring circus took over the town and the big tops in distress and the circus freaks have hit the streets so i'm begging you ringmaster please we've been forced to live our lives on an endless flying trapeze Contracted rabies When it spread to your animals We had to hide our babies And your fortune tellers Are only predicting maybe So could you please Could you please Could you please Pack up your circus tent And you 
unicycle lanes could replace our public transit. And your arsonistic fire breathers were caught red handed. So could you please, could you put to sleep, could you put to sleep your dog and pony show? Jumping through hoops and juggling knives. We remember stories from before you rolled in about having simpler lives. But as I look down from the wire to the ground, I'm getting quite upset. Cause I see thousands of others flopping like fish in your overflowing safety net. at the base of the ivory towers while your executive clowns are at the top working bankers hours and your midway scam artists have all the legal powers so could you go could you go could you go show out on the road yeah Jeez. that's a that song is a that's a mindful that one what is what's that about Jay what's going on inside that head of yours there still trying to find out <laughs> well uh, I wrote that in the world windiest that's a real word time of my life where um a lot of stuff was happening. A lot of curveballs were being thrown, and uh, it got. And then just things kept going on, kept happening, kept happening. I was like, "This is crazy." So instead of um, wallowing in it, you know, I did my share. Uh, I decided to make a complete satire of it, and maybe write some ridiculous things and get it out that way, and uh, scare the crap out of myself in the process. So. <laughs> So win-win for everybody. And that's got, uh, I mean, that's not the only song. You've got other songs that reference donkeys and yeah. elephants and circuses. And your, uh, even the, the cover of your first album has a picture of you. I think it's taken from a Ferris wheel yeah. of you yes. down in the fairgrounds with your guitar. That's right. Taken, like, taken by Roberta Hunt. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah from the, the exhibition in Toronto. And uh, yeah, it's... Honestly, the, the animals, I feel like they have a very distinct personality of some kind, or at least what they symbolize. And maybe you can kind of, well, maybe avoid a whole bunch of sentences and stuff by just picking one. And then, oh, there, we know what he's talking about. But you probably don't, and that's cool. As long as I feel like maybe you understand it, then, then I'll write it down, I guess. Uh, is your family musical? Uh, my uh, my dad, I grew, yeah. up, I grew up with... Uh, Bagpipes galore. It was uh, <laughs> every weekend practicing. Um, my dad was like world class bagpiper. He's he still plays and he goes to Scotland and competes in the worlds. And uh, his band was the first um, the first pipe band from outside of the UK to win the world championship of piping. So <laughs> wow. I know like, oh, there's a world championship of piping. Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah. I was like, whoa, but yeah, um, serious stuff. So I remember once uh, Jay took me. To see, it's the the Toronto Police yeah, Pipe Band. The Toronto Police Pipe Band, yeah. And uh, Jay took me to see them record a live album at the Elma Combo. That's right. Yeah. They recorded a live album at the Elma Combo. That's it was right. brilliant. Yeah. When I was a kid, I, uh, I I watched my dad play Massey Hall. You know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, their band played. Ma that's kind of. I want to do that. <laughs> but this is you know this is cool. This is good. Let's just. <laughs> yeah. This is fine. We're done. <laughs> I switched my goal. So. <laughs> Are there any sort of lyrical top topics that you've uh, that you've wanted to write about, but just have never been able to get a, a handle on? Like uh, most of your stuff seems pretty dark. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I write about whatever is really um, maybe consuming myself. Um, it just has to happen, and it would be cool to write the next Black Eyed Peas tune or something, and just like you know, <laughs> talk about how tonight's really gonna be a good good night. <laughs> <laughs> but I already know that, and everybody knows it's already a great night, so forget it. <laughs> when did you start playing? And why? How did music become a part of what you do? Well, I, I actually um, I learned uh, piano first. I, I took piano lessons from when I was like seven years old. And then guitar seemed cool. So I was like, I'm going to do what's cool and get a guitar. And look how cool I am now. It's crazy. <laughs> I mean, honestly. And I grew my hair long, believe it or not. <laughs> Fifteen years old with a brand new shiny Mexican Stratocaster. <laughs> and uh, within six months, I realized that uh, it's time for an acoustic guitar. I don't know. Nice. So, up next is uh, is Timbuk Twelve. This is one of your newest songs, right? Yeah, it's a newer one. in my squinting eyes should never mirror you this take on me was humbling reverted to sincere you caught what I was fumbling thanks we made it clear oh tectonically there's rumbling and the epicenter's heat caught me, I was stumbling, thanks we've made it clear, it's a lesson of the year, so thanks we've made it clear.
What is uh, what's Timbuk 12? What what is that? Um, I think. Well, I figured that Timbuk 2 seemed really far away, and I thought like, I want to talk about a place that I've maybe been mentally that's like at least like I don't know what is that six times further. <laughs> so I just went six <laughs> times further out and came up, came back with this. I was like, pretty weird over there. Are you you give your audience a lot of credit for being able to listen to things that are very dark and intensely personal. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel safe doing that, putting yourself out there like that? Uh, does it look really, like I, a, do a, I, does a, it look like I do? It's a big stretch for a lot of writers, yeah. you know, not wanting to not expose themselves, not make themselves vulnerable to the audience, but you seem perfectly fine with that. Good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, pretty good. Okie dokie. Sorry. I that was a whole card, too. <laughs> I, I can go on more. It's, yeah, I thought that was good. Yeah. <laughs> There's a distinct Indian hue to some of the stuff that you do, some of the harmony that you use. Yeah. Uh, how did that manage to get into your music? Um, same uh, in the teen years of uh, departing from the piano. I found a record uh, in my parents' <laughs> basement, and it had Ravi Shankar and Yehudi, Yehudi Menuhin. Menuhin. Yeah. East meets West, West meets East. I put it on the record player of all places, and um, it was it was incredible to me. And and uh, I think maybe because it did have a little bit of, uh, of the West to it, and like European musician as well, that it was it was accessible. I mean, these time signatures are pretty wild, mm -hmm. so it. it showed me that music um, beautifully and still could kind of understand some of it. Yeah. And I, I got a sitar. I went to uh, I went to Scarborough, you know, that's where they sell sitars. How much how much I just started walking around I was like, does anyone know? <laughs> yeah, and I found one. And you, you found Sitars or Us. On yeah, Midland Sitars Avenue. or Us. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, it's a good place. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've had it for a long time. I, I never I mean all you hear is like prodigies on sitar, you know. The, like people who dedicated their lives. Yeah. I, I just got it because I couldn't really sleep much and thought maybe I could play it uh, <laughs> while I was up. And then after you heard yeah. that uh, that Ravi Shankar Yehudi Menuhin album, how long was it after that that you got your sitar? Oh, it wasn't long at all. Yeah, like uh, maybe half an hour. <laughs> so why don't you uh, you brought your sitar? Yeah. yeah why don't yeah. you uh, why don't you play us something? All right. Yeah, I'll just play like a couple of seconds. Just to yeah. Good for therapy. Cheaper than therapy. The fact that all of you have come here uh, means more than I could ever tell you. And uh, helping to make the show a success, I really appreciate it. And I want to make sure that all of you get home safely to those you love. So thank you. The last song you're going to play is The Mess. And this is another fairly new one. I remember yeah. while you were writing this, once in a while you'd invite me over to your place to hear bits of it. I guess part of it is the, the Indian influence in some of the stuff that you do. But there are other influences too. And... and I'm sure a lot of songwriters will appreciate trying to build tension and release into a song. And in this song, you, you build that tension in, in the verse. And then there's a part where you go into these beautiful minor chords. <laughs> we both said, oh, wait, you're going Dan McLean Jr. all of a sudden. Yeah, I'm going Dan It was these minor sort of soul passage. And then right after that, first time you do that big bend on the high E string, the, the tension is so is so apparent in the audience. I've seen a bunch of audiences, the first time they hear it, giggle. Mm. 
And it's not because it's funny, it's because that tension and release is so well done that people have to have some way to let that emotion out. It just, it just astounds me, the way you're able to do that. And that's a perfect example in that song. Well, thanks. Man. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jay Pollock with The Mess. Yeah, big mess.
Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Thanks, buddy. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for coming to the first ever Rhyme and Reason show. Hope we're going to be able to do this more often. Uh, and uh, now we're going to all play together, Kevin, Jay, and myself. Every one of these shows is going to include one or two songs that myself and my collaborators have written together for the show. And uh, this is the song that we wrote for this one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting song. It's the best song ever. <laughs> Put, a, put us three in one room. And <laughs> Don't even worry about uh, it. It's the best song ever. So this is uh, this is one that uh, that Jay and I sing, and the uh, the premise is that well, first the songwriting thing was these two guys had never co-written before. They'd never written with other people. Don't uh, work and play well with others. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? And. Uh, the first time we got together, I didn't know what, like it was, I felt like I was running a kindergarten. These two guys were just noodling and making yeah. jokes, and we weren't getting any work done. But we decided, uh, we took the chicken's way out, and it, it, I think it came out kind of fun. We decided that uh, for the verses, uh, Jay and I would use the same chords, but we would write different melodies and lyrics from our own perspective. So it was like we were both writing the song differently, but we'd present the song as one piece. Yeah. And uh, we thought it'd be kind of cool if we were, uh, if Jay and I were childhood friends. Uh, now we're grown up yeah, we sure and are. we're fighting over the same woman. So we're both vying for the attention of, uh, of that same woman.
That's all right, we can edit that. I can edit that. That's no problem. What do you mean? That's no problem. <laughs> Did we make a mistake? <laughs> rhombus. rhombus. Every tune needs a rhombus. Jay's, Jay's lyrics have cheering sections. <laughs> <laughs> I think we knew that even even in rehearsal, we knew that rhombus yeah, I was, gonna do was gonna take yeah, it. I was gonna yeah, do I was gonna take it. <laughs> Everything else was. So, guys, for you, what was uh, this being your first time doing co-writing? What was it like for you to, to get into this co-writing thing with the, uh, with the other two of us? Dan, it was like work. I never oh, want to yeah. do that again. <laughs> I never want to do that again. Yeah. Let's not do that again. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I appreciate that you tried to make it easy. It was like the Surrealists had a, a thing that they called Exquisite Corpse, and you would just draw a little piece, and then you'd, you'd, you'd fold a piece of paper, and, and each person would draw a little piece and hand it along to the next person. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see what the other person had drawn, then you'd open it up and you'd have what they called an exquisite corpse. So that's kind of what we did. Yeah, yeah. Which I appreciated you making it as easy on us as you could. Still, it was work and uh, I'm resentful. All right. <laughs> so. I will play accordion to punish you. <laughs> How about you, Jay? What was it like for you, first right. time? It was, it was a... Uh, Honestly, that was a very stressful time. That first time we got together, I was, I was like mentally, physically, and whatever else in the netherworld exhausted. God, and that uh, wasn't just me. Yeah, it, it was tough, but uh, I, I liked uh, how we, we got past our, our first time ever doing that. Yeah. And like, uh, in terms then you of wrote two verses, though, Jay. I know. Yeah, well, I couldn't get it all in. I had to do a double <laughs> verse. You can't just hang on a rhombus and, and just, I mean, whoever but does But the rhombus it. was in the first verse. You could have stopped there. Yeah. You had to keep him laughing yeah. for two verses. I know. Yeah. Our next song's writer, Mr. Kevin Wayne. Now this is uh, Mr. Valentine's Dead. Mm -hmm. Love, love, love this song. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Valentine's dead and he's drinking Manhattan's singing a coal miner's tune in his daddy's tuxedo and Fred Astaire shoes he's the best looking corpse in the room Mr. Valentine's dead and the angels are waiting down at the end of the bar Drinking martinis and laughing at nothing, smoking banner cigars. If you ever seen dead men dancing so lightly, if you ever heard corpses who sing, Mr. Valentine's dead, and the angels are taken, not till he's finished his dream. Stay on his feet And he bangs on the table And orders around And he 
haze with a gold in his teeth. Mr. Valentine's dead, and he's singing in Spanish, wearing a rose in his hair. But now the angels are howling, drinking tequila, shooting their guns in the air. Oh, you ever seen dead men? Sing so lightly Have you ever heard corpses who sing? Mr. Valentine's dead The angels are taken And that's at least finished his drink Mr. Valentine's dead, but he still loves Hardy. He's always the last one to leave. And he hangs down his head and cries like a baby when the band's playing Goodnight Irene. Mr. Valentine's dead, but he never looks better. Till at least we won't need him tonight. Tell his mom to stop crying, the band to keep playing. The angels are too drunk to fly. Have you ever seen dead men dancing so lightly? Have you ever heard corpses who sing? Mr. Valentine's dead. The angels are taken. Not till he's finished his drink. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Pretty good. Wow, uh, that's fun. It's such a thrill for me to play with the two of you guys. Uh, again, I want to thank Donald Kwan and Roger Sater yeah. for their hospitality. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I want to thank Bob Groza and Kevin Dunn for taking care of the video. Andrew, for being our official photographer of the night. Other people pay, taking pictures, too. Thank you very much. Uh, and Roberta Hunt. What can you tell us about this? <laughs> what can you tell us about this tune, Jay? And it's the last tune I was saying to Dan. I think that people actually will have nightmares if we do this tune last. Yeah. But, and Dan's like, yeah, okay, then let's do it then. So let's go. <laughs> it's called The Good Old Days. It's all in good fun. <laughs>
celebrities in six billion magazines. We airbrushed our own centerfolds and felt part of the scene. We kept up with the latest fashion, packed our closets full with the skeletons we earned to make it all It's the good old days. It's the good old days. It's the good old days. Oh. Ooh. Created some religion. was a billboard and every channel a commercial paparazzi's in the bushes so don't be too controversial it's the good old days it's the good old days it's the good old Extremism of virtue, we were bored by perfect tense. And if the record wasn't shattered, you would lose all of your friends. To stay out of the gossip, we refrained from making sound. The news told us the plague was here, so we all moved underground. And since fashion didn't matter, It's the good old days. It's the good old days. It's the good old days. Oh, 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 Yeah, thank Thanks, you very guys. much, everybody. This is Rhyme and Reason. My name's Dan McLean, Jr. That's Kevin Quain. And Jay Pollock. And you people are the best. Thank you very much. See you next time. <laughs>